Before you do that, let me just say, Bob Benke reminded me with all of the masters in urban planning students here. I, I gave a talk the first time I did this. It was in Minneapolis to the city council and the what's it called, the Met Council, Bob, uh, the regional. And Alan uh, has, a, has a history in transportation. He's been in the field for a few years. And uh, I've known Alan uh, for about 10 years when he, uh, since he came to UC Berkeley when I was a grad student and gave a talk uh, in about, uh, about uh, yeah, 10 years ago. So Alan is well known for his series of books, uh, Commuting in America, Commuting in America 2, and very creatively titled <laughs> Commuting in America 3. And, uh, but just to alert you, and I used this joke earlier this morning, but to alert you to the fact that he can be a little more creative, he's also the author of an article on his website about uh, mobility with pepperoni and extra cheese. So on that note, I will turn it over to uh, Alan Pisarski, who will be talking about the end of commuting. Thanks, Rob. Um, Rob suggested that maybe I should do some self-introduction, and I, and I won't really bother much other than to say that I've been doing this <coughs> commuting in America for, for 20 years or so, and as a one of the great opera producers uh, said to one of his singers, uh, you'll keep doing it till you get it right, you know. Um, and uh, I don't know how many more of these I have in me, so I think we'll probably call it a day with this one. But uh, it has been a great privilege, really, to, to work on this. And uh, I find it a subject of endless fascination. Maybe I'm just easily fascinated. I don't know. But I really do love the work. I love the the collision of demography with geography and the interaction of, in our society between social, economic, and uh, logistics and engineering and, and, and technology, all of it that goes to it. I have some material here that's based on Commuting in America 3, which um, you've probably seen or heard something about. Um, it's out now, I guess, a couple of weeks, printed by the, the National Academies. Uh, and it's been a lot of fun talking to the press, and as I mentioned in the discussion before, I've been very pleased at how, how, how bright the press has been and how um, thoughtful and how into the report. I mean, they actually have read it, and you know, it's not like they're kind of waiting for me to kind of um, spoon feed them. They're, they are engaged, so it's great to hear. I'm going to talk about that process, more about the process of creating community in America its data issues and its some of its ramifications, and a lot of the material that goes into the book, I would, um, I recognize that this is a smart bunch, and so I'm going to move quickly through the material, um, and you're allowed to stop me and slow me down, because people t tend to say that I sometimes can go too fast through this stuff, but I, I think most of you are heavily familiar with a lot of this, so I I feel comfortable in kind of moving through it. Um, <clears throat> I, this is my reflex on our national goal today, which is making things get worse slower. Uh, Mary Peters, when she was Federal Highway Administrator, I said this was the motto of FHWA, and Mary um, hasn't forgiven me for that. And 
And it's okay. I figured she went back to Arizona, so it didn't matter. Now she's secretary, so now I'm really in trouble. Uh, she's a great lady. Uh, I really do love her dearly, and uh, uh, she probably will make me eat those words. Uh, but it does bear on my point. My What I like to bring to this discussion is my goal here, and this is my description of my goal, is to reduce the effects of distance as an inhibiting force in our society's ability to realize its economic and social aspirations. And that brings, I hope, transportation into a broader context than getting into arguments about some of the, the smaller parts of it. This is a very critical part of it. And I think one of the things I like to emphasize in, in, in these discussions is that transportation, that America is a very transportation-oriented nation, very much focused in its whole social and economic being. I like to talk about the, the tyranny of distance, which is actually a, a phrase that was originally applied to Australia, which I think it applies to as, as well. But I, I, it's not a shock that it's a big country, but I think it is important to recognize that America has probably done a better job of addressing the challenge of distance uh, than any, any nation in the world. And it has, uh, has an immense impact on our ability to function as a nation. And as we go out into the future, um, competing in a more global world environment, I think it will be even more important. Um, transportation basically about time and distance. Um, I think that in recent years and out into the future, time will come to dominate pressures of time in a society where people are more affluent, where goods are more valuable, the pressures of time will come to dominate. As I was saying to a group earlier today, that a more affluent society next year will view the same transportation system more negatively because they bring a value of time that's greater to it. Uh, a shipper who has a more valuable product than he had last year will judge the system more harshly. And so I think we in the transportation profession are in effect dealing with a moving target and it's one that's, that's, one that's, that's going to judge us more harshly over time. Um, and so the automobile, the truck, I think is very frequently going to be the response. We want to talk about what technology is making the thing go. But in a high, come, high income world, high value world, where these things are, are true, the, va the pressures of time will always be the dominant uh, pressure. A little bit about our world today. These are some of the summary characteristics. I've kind of low-lighted globalization because I'm not going to talk about that. I am going to talk about some of these other things that are important factors. The keys here are, well, let me just go to the next slide. I think that's this is a shorter version of basically that, the demographic story. The Community in America series kind of accidentally, I didn't start out with this in mind, but it really documents the history of the baby boom generation and its workforce years. Um, and now that group is moving off stage and we're entering a new phase, a new stage, and that's where we talked about the end of commuting. Um, this new stage is going to be very different, I believe. Uh, the past stage uh, is, has been immensely, immensely challenging. And I think many people don't recognize the, the wrenching forces that we've been subjected to in our transportation world and in our society. And a world in which, by and large, I think we've done rather well. We met a, a, an extraordinary set of challenges. Uh, women joining the labor force in tremendous numbers, the baby boomers coming of working age, the proliferation of the automobile, on and on and on. Um, and we came through it relatively well. That, a lot of that is behind us. The world is maybe a little bit easier to operate on. S new challenges, different challenges. The big one will be where are these workers going to come from? The, how do we replace the, uh, the generation? A lot of things are going to be more stable. Licenses, vehicles, workers, population, migration, relatively stable. The changing forces, incomes, locations, where do people want to be? Uh, immigrants, and what do they look like? Who are they? What are their skill levels? Where are they going to be? Uh, and the aging 
labor force and the aging population in general. So those are those are the the way the panoply, I guess, the balance that I'm talking about between stable and and change. This is a little bit of a statistical chart to, to give you some context of where we are. These are the census uh, counts of the population up through uh, 1990 to 2000. And, uh, <clears throat> and all of a sudden, this was the, the census projection for 2000. In, in December of 2000, the census projection was for a population of 275. And then they published the decennial, and it came in at like 283. And they all of a sudden had found 7 or 8 million people. Um, as if 7 or 8 million Mexicans had come across the border dying to be counted by the Bureau of the Census. And I think what happened is these people have been here a long time. And the census has got around the finding them. Uh, the census believes that, too, because they then shifted back in their their new estimates don't really even recognize that dramatic growth that they saw in the decennial. And they've gone back to, to fundamentally this long-term projection that kind of looks like business as usual. So I would not be shocked to see the 2010 census be a big surprise again and see 8 or 10 million people that we didn't know we had. If you look at the projections, uh, you know, you could do it with a straight edge. Uh, they spend a lot of money doing these projections, but if basically started out in 1950, add 25 million per decade, and you pretty much got it right. And this is how we have grown. This is how we're projected to grow. The traditional thing that they show is this chart, uh, which is not too revealing. It, it's kind of slow with this red line. You see it declining. And that's the working age population. But it doesn't look so terrible. And the older population increasing, and that does look significant. The younger population stable. This is the kind of traditional view. But you, you have to recognize what's going on here. And it's really rather dramatic. The, the blue line is the percentage of, this is males. Uh, you can just multiply it by two, pretty much. Uh, but this is the percentage of people, of, of men, who are of working age. And this is what happens to it. It, it, it goes from 60% to 54% uh, in, in basically 20 years. From 2000 to 2010, we added 20 million workers. I'm sorry, 20 million people of working age. Over the next two decades, we'll add 12 million. So we're going to have this immense drop off in the number of people of working age. In order to maintain our labor force, in order to keep going, we're going to have to uh, get a whole lot of folks into the labor force, more than we ever have before. Get more women into the workforce even than we have. Try to hold on to older workers, men and women, longer. Uh, more immigrants population. Engaging the rural population, which tends to be underemployed in this country, and bringing the rural populations to the metro areas to work. Some of you saw the article in the Oregonian today, and I mentioned that to them in, in that interview. And this really means, in many instances, people commuting long distances. These are rural populations, in many cases, who don't or can't uh, afford urban housing, don't want to leave their rural populations. But as the jobs move out to the suburbs, it becomes real, realistic and competitive for them to consider commuting into the metro area. Uh, <clears throat> and you can think of it of inner city populations commuting out to those jobs and rural populations commuting in and competing, competing somewhere in the middle. So it's going to be a very changing, strong environment. Th these are the workers that we added over the decades. And you can see it has dropped off. And so our problem in the future may be uh, too few commuters rather than too many. I don't want to overstate it too much, but it is going to be uh, an important task. This is a chart that we have talked about in a couple of cases this morning. And this basically says that commuting is a small and declining share of the action. And so people can say, why do you keep writing about it? Uh, <clears throat> it's still very important, and for some reasons we can identify. But I insist to you guys, especially those of you who are going to be working in the profession, that it is very important to keep this whole list in mind when you're addressing a question. Um, 
often we say we're going to talk about transportation, we immediately forget freight, and then we forget all the other passenger activity, and so we go to commuting, we get into an argument about transit versus highways, and think we're talking about transportation. And I really think that that's not a particularly productive way to spend time. And I, I would really argue that you need to, to focus on all of these things and recognize them as part of your planning process. I said in the book <clears throat> 10 years ago <clears throat> that there's no metropolitan agency, no state agency that can describe what's going on in their area statistically in all those eight categories. And I'd be willing to bet on that. Talking a little bit about where commuting is, this is the share by day of, of commute, of percentage of, of all trip purposes. And as you can see, the peak is, what, 19 point something percent earlier in the week, but typically 16, 17 percent, uh, depending upon how you want to count. Declining in all of these different measures, this is person trips, vehicle trips, person miles, vehicle miles, all of them basically declining over time, not because because work travel is declining, but because everything else is growing so fast. Here you see the work trip roughly, uh, they're saying this is trips per capita, but you see that everything else is, is really booming, especially the, uh, uh, the family personal business stuff. So it, it's declining in, in, as a share of the total action. This is the key to our future. Uh, the red are the number of workers out of the total bar, which is workers and non-workers by age group. And as you see, you get out here to 55 to 64, very sharp break. And the whole question in a lot of our future will be, where's the red and the blue break here? How many of these people in the 65 to 74 year old age group are you going to be able to keep in the labor force? <clears throat> And to what ramifications will that have in the society if you do? You're going to have many older people in the transit systems, in the, in the highway systems, uh, <clears throat> and that could have safety ramifications, could have other effects. Uh, there are already indications that, uh, that we're seeing that happen, and I'll talk about that in a sec. This is a final piece, a little background here, something that I want to bring your attention that out into the future as the population ages, VMT per, per capita declines, even though the growth, which is the, see, this is the red is the change, has been prodigious in the, in the older age groups, they still have much lower levels of, 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 of travel than the 35 to 54 year old age groups. Um, so in many respects, a lot of our world will be a more operable one, one that I think that we can address and engage in. Um, one of the interesting trends that I've been around to see, this is 1980. This is all the metro areas over a million in the country. And this is their share of, of driving alone single occupant vehicle. Uh, this is Detroit up here with about 1980, about 75%, and that's New York. Uh, the only one down below 60%. Um, okay, 1990, and the average growth in the average growth in driving alone is from eight to ten percentage points. And this is all areas over a million. And there's a couple that didn't grow quite as much, but by and large, nationally, the pattern was a substantial increase in driving alone. This is 2000, and yes, there's still an increase, but the increase is more on the order of 2%. Um, so I, back in Community America 2, I argued that we were seeing some stabilization of driving alone, that is to say the, the increase in driving alone. And the answer is yes, it is still growing, but it is more stable, and the, the growth rates are are, are small relative to the past. And I think we have reached some kind of a level of saturation on that. In fact, in the West, uh, for the first time, we saw some areas where there actually was a decline in driving alone, which was unheard of in the past. Decline in, per, in share percentages, not in absolute. Uh, Seattle uh, was one and a half percentage points. Portland here, I think, was 
like under one percentage point, but still, I mean, these things are not big numbers, but the fact that they happen at all is of interest. Uh, but almost all of it the West Coast, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Las Vegas, um, very much, and I'd love to have some of you PhD students look into this, almost a kind of a regression toward the mean. The Western states that had traditionally very high levels of driving alone, very little transit and carpool, um, not carpool, very little transit, uh, were sliding towards some center in the eastern areas where the very high transit and lower uh, driving alone were sliding in the other direction. And so the country, in some ways, is looking a little bit more homogeneous. On the other hand, we do have this variation now between areas of the country where the West has seen some growth and the rest of the country not. <clears throat> These are some special transit tabulations that were done by the Urban Data Committee, a TRB, uh, a committee dear to my heart. Uh, the census gave up describing census, uh, central business districts probably 20 years ago. Just They found it really hard to do and to have any kind of a uniform definition of what a CBD looked like. And so uh, the Urban Data Committee took on itself uh, with metro planners the definition on an ad hoc basis in each metro area of a CBD. And I don't know if you guys wanted to play that game in Portland, how you might define that CBD and we'll accept the fact that it's probably going to be arbitrary. Two people would probably do it differently. But still, the, the notion of a CBD is a significant one that we've lost because the census had such definition problems. But anyway, this kind of illustrates the story. This is, if you look at transit, and this is share of metro work travel, and you can see Wash DC 9% down to Dallas at 1.8%, not a very big thing. But if, if you focus in on the central city, obviously this goes up in Dallas. It doesn't go up by much to 2.6, but still New York jumps, and this is now the central city definition within the metro area. And then if you go further into the CBD, you see a very strong focus on downtown, 38% to downtown of DC. For those of you who know Washington, the downtown is basically where the TRB meaning is the Hilton South, that area. Uh, New York, I think what I used here is there's a couple of CBD definitions, but I think this one is 42nd Street, Manhattan South to, to Wall Street. Could you just clarify this is percent of people who work in those locations using transit? Yes. It's, it's percent work trip uh, by, by transit, yeah. Um, <clears throat> And we also look at some of the corridors where transit is, is, is strong and, and, and get similar results, some very attractive uh, results. One of the things the book looks at is four dichotomies that I call them, that I think are revealing. And I, I suggest them to you for you to look at when you're looking at stuff. The one is whether you're over or under 20 minutes and commute, whether you're in or out of a metro over 5 million, uh, whether you're before or after 8 o'clock or over or under 55. Um, <clears throat> the one thing I'll call attention to is we have now 12 metros in America over 5 million, which is a third of the population, 100 million people living in those 12 metros. And that's the, that's the focus of an awful lot of the action in American congestion and, and economic output. That's a third of the population. I have no idea what percent of the GDP it is, but it's a big, big chunk. I'm sure it's better than a third. Um, these big metros are the economic engines of the nation. But I use these dichotomies occasionally, and I don't know whether we'll, how deep we'll get into it here, but they, I think, have their power to reveal. Um, you're probably all familiar, familiar with the average travel times. I won't spend a lot of time on it, other than to say that it grew, strangely enough. As, it, even as the number of workers declined, it grew faster. And so... In some ways, I think you could argue that we're kind of running out of the capacity that, that, that the world bequeathed to us. Um, reporters love to talk about extreme commutes. Um, I prefer to focus on the two things that I use is the percent of the population under 20 minutes and the percent of the population over 60 and looking at the tails of the distribution, which I think is much more sensible than looking at averages. Um, Historically, America had more than half the population getting to work in 20 minutes. 
which is to say, in my view, you have nothing to complain about. If you're getting to work on the 20 minutes, and however, whatever mode it is, you're, you're doing pretty well. Uh, but that is declining. It's now down to 47 percent, very strongly affected by, uh, by metro area size. Uh, you're seeing, and this is, I mean, you probably have hard, trouble seeing it in the back. This is 5 million or more, and that's 50,000 down there. So this is metro size class, and you've got more than 10 percent, 11, 12 percent of people over 60 minutes in the 5 million group drops off very sharply, and the 20 minute thing has exactly the opposite effect as you would expect. Um, <clears throat> here again is an example of the 5 million effect. Carpooling, working at home, very stable with respect to city size. Transit absolutely, tremendously affected by scale. Um, and you see if you compare working at home to transit, you get to a stage where somewhere around 2.5 million in many metro areas, working at home is a bigger factor in, in, in commuting than, than is transit. And it's, it's the, the work at home segment is the only factor, call it a mode, I guess, uh, that has been growing continuously along with driving along. It's, it's an important force. It's now more important than, than walking to work. And I think out into the future, it'll be even more significant. Here again, you see transit share by metro area size. You already saw some piece of this. And this is stratified by central city and, and suburban. And you can see the, the very strong influence of, of scale, of metro size scale. I talked to the Women's Transportation Seminar this morning, and this is one of the things we talked about. Um, women comprise roughly 47% of, uh, of the labor force. Uh, early in the morning, it's a guy thing, very heavily oriented to males. You get up to 7.30, it begins to shift over, and in fact becomes majority female. Uh, in this period, and then about 9.30, 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock, it starts to shift back again. Um, a lot of reasons that we could discuss about this. I won't go into them. But it, it's an important, it's a important difference in this eight, eight before and after thing. That's one of the factors. This is another factor. Um, before eight, up until eight, it's about 92, 93% automobile based in the nation. After 8 o'clock, walking, transit, bicycling begin to, to play. This is all of the non-auto modes, I guess is what you should know you're looking at here. And you begin to see it here, and then it, again after 10, 11 o'clock it drops back again. So <clears throat> there's, a, there's a time factor here which I had not observed before. I don't know, maybe somebody else has seen this and can explain it better than that. but. This is a, came as something of, a, of an interesting surprise to me. One of the important changes is this, uh, the press gets very enamored with, is this sliding to the, the shoulders. Um, a little bit hard to read this, so let me take you through it. Basically what this says is, um, here, from 5 to 6.30 a.m., the 14.7 percent of the, of the workers were traveling in that time period, leaving home in that time period, in 90, but they in their, their in the share of change, they had 25 percent. So we have an extreme shift away from the 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 so-called peak period, and it's increasingly important. And this is, I think, one of the real measures of the failure of the system when when you start seeing people traveling. 11 percent of the growth is in people traveling before 5 a.m. Yes, ma'am. Oh, WA? Everybody knows WA. It's work at home. And you can see work at home was 3% and it was 6% of the growth. Um, it's a shorthand that one gets into. When, sorry. The boomers aging out. This immense slug of the boomers right on the, urge, uh, on the verge of going into 65. 
is the population 55 and above. Half of them are in this 55 to 59 year old age group. A big, big factor. Are they going to shift out? Are they going to retire and go away? Or are they going to stay in the labor force? Um, mode changes significantly over 55. Here you see driving alone dropping off rather sharply. You can't see the uh, the carpool effect, so I'll blow that up a little bit. Did I miss it? Huh, I guess I did. I'm sorry, but carpooling does the same thing. It drops off. And this is the modes under carpooling and under driving alone, and you see dramatic increases in working at home. Um, and some some changes in walk, little bit of modification in transit, more trading back and forth between the transit modes. But uh, this is the, uh, the important and uh, maybe critical factor in our future in terms of people working at home in the older age groups. As some people have pointed out to me, driven a lot by the new technologies, by our services economy, et cetera. The boomers aging out, one of the things in terms of their travel times, you see that the, both the youngers and the older folks tend to commute with shorter distances. It's the, it's the younger people in the middle working years that have the long commutes. And this is not a shock. As I was saying, in, uh, people in, the older people, in effect, can make trade-offs, can opt to live near work and pay the mortgage that it might cost. The younger person may not have that option. And so they're trading travel time for mortgage payments. Talking about the aging out, I say the, the, the shift has already begun. 11.2% of the workers, over, uh, of the folks over 65 were workers in 90, now 12% uh, in 2000. The 2005 data shows 12.7%, so we're already beginning to see the fact that this workforce is staying around. And as I say, it's a very positive thing, but on the other hand, it's got some real issues. If you take it out to 2020, even if you don't assume that that share, even if you assume that share is going to remain constant, and I'm pretty sure it won't, uh, you're going to have twice as many people commuting over 65 as we do now. So I think there's going to be a real important factor in our addressing that, whether it's in transit or in automobiles or whatever other mode it might be. Um, we haven't talked much about immigrants. Uh, they are a key part of the, the working age groups, the 16 to 65, the people of potential work uh, participation. Obviously, very few of them in the 65-year-old age group, a heavy portion of them in the young age groups. Um, the immigrant component of, of modes is very, very variable. You can see here, this is the driving alone and and a very small share of driving alone, colossal shares of carpool. Five and six person carpool is 40% immigrant. Um, and you can see throughout, this is kind of the, the, uh, the immigrant signature, if you will, in these different modes, and, and you can kind of study it at leisure. Over time, this is immigrants who have been here five years, five to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to 20, or over 20. And it starts out with very strong commitments to carpooling, dramatic, in fact, carpooling, transit use, even walking and bicycling, very strong bicycling, which surprised me. Uh, but over time, it transitions into something more typical uh, of, uh, of the overall population. Over time, carpooling, which is very powerful, as I mentioned, declines. And... Uh, over time, transit use declines, bus and, and rail. Think about this, recognize the temporal nature of this, that each, each five-year contingent has a replacement cohort that's coming in. That's a, there's a new group. And so it's not that this, you're going to see the changes in these modes. There's going to be replacement groups that are coming in with those with those characteristics, characteristic modal signatures, I guess. The, the power of affluence in our society is, is not to be 
dismissed. Uh, immense part of our issue set in the in the country is the fact that we are a very affluent society, and so a lot of the products that we deal in, in terms of congestion, etc., is a product of that affluence. Transportation spending rises in shares of income as incomes rises. As a percentage of income, transportation spending rises with income, um, except to the highest uh, the highest levels that you see there. Um, trips per household rises with income. I'm sure you've probably seen that. That's the median income where we are in the nation today. Portland is higher than that. Uh, work trip lengths. I mean, this is a PhD thesis of ever I saw one. Work trip length increases with income, which almost belies some of the, the thoughts we might have. But presumably, the high income people would be the ones who could optimize. But you have to realize in America, high income households, not typically the product of one person making a lot of money. High income households are high income households because they've got a lot of people earning money. High income households, uh, the highest quintile has three times as many workers as the lowest quintile. So it's an aggregate process, and that has immense ramifications for transportation. Because if you have two and three workers in a household, the approach to transportation and travel is very, very different. And the ability to, for instance, live near work when you have two workers, three workers, is really pretty tricky. Mode choice by income, as you would expect. At 25K, you see the first house, the first car come into play by 40,000. You see the second car come into play nationally. The modes have income signatures, and uh, uh, you can play with this again. I just show it to you here. You take a look. This is uh, the, the blue is the over 100,000. The highest income signature is in commuter rail and ferry boats. Don't know what they're doing on those ferry boats, but 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 they but that's a that's a I guess if you ride ferries, you get to be rich. I want to talk about vehicles a little bit. Saturation. This is a long-term picture, 1910. Um, some people talk about being too oriented to the automobile as if it's a recent phenomenon. By the mid-30s, everybody in America could sit in an automobile, um, and it's a very strong phenomenon. We're seeing some stabilization of it. The shares by, by auto ownership, I think since 1980, have been relatively stable. Percent zero vehicles, percent one, percent two. We've seen some blip in the one vehicle households as the, uh, as the immigrant populations gain auto ownership. One of the big changes, and perhaps one of the most important, is this African American shift from 90 to 2,000, from 34, I'm sorry, 31% down to 24% of African American households without vehicles. And uh, this little thing here is 2005 data, new survey, American Community Survey, so I, I wouldn't exactly argue how comparable it is, but the ACS puts you down around 21%. And all of the other mode, uh, the, uh, uh, the Hispanic shift down and the, 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 the non-Hispanic white shifts down. So this is up through 2005. Uh, the 2006 with the, uh, the high gas prices, I'm sure I'll put a crimp in that. I don't know how it worked out. I don't need that one. Uh, this again is the foreign-born ownership of uh, those that arrived between, in the last five years, very high levels of zero car ownership that transitioned down over time, again, to be replaced by new cohorts. A little bit about geography. This is a chart that you many have seen in the past, the shift of, towards suburbanization. And obviously, it began in this century uh, and has been one of the dominant forces in our geography. Um, this is where we're going, and I guess we're coming your way. Uh, the remarkable point is that Texas, Florida, and California each get 15% of future growth, according to the census. And all of the Midwest and Northeast get 12%. And this is out from 2000 to 2030. So there's going to be an immense focus in the West 
in the South and in those Caltexula, those three states that have been absorbing roughly half the population growth. So it's going to be dramatic shifts which are going to change the nature of many aspects of the society in terms of our focus on equity and certain aspects of the society. There's going to be some real kicks. The focus in the future, I think, is going to be on these big metros. The short version of this is simply we had 53 areas over a million in 2005, probably be 60 by 2020. Um, that obviously will continue. And as I mentioned to you before, 12 areas with more than 5 million, a third of the nation's population. And this is going to be one of the major economic engines of, in our future. Um, I won't go into the statistics here, but it's a mess. The census has really hurt us with their definitions and redefinitions of what metro is, what central cities are. And so when you approach this, you can get into all kinds of trouble because of the changing definitions if you try to compare one period to another. They do some very special tabulations for me in this thing that tries to null out some of these suburban confusion in the, in the definitions. One of the things I focused on is the percent of, of workers leaving their home county to work. And it has been, again, a dramatic increase. This is a measure that I use as one of the, the changes along with early start times and long distance commutes. These three things, I think, kind of go together. But this is dramatic across the entire country. This is uh, Georgia. This is 1990. The yellow are counties shifting more than 25% of their workers out of the county every day to work. And this is 2000. And you can see how, go back and look at that. That's that. That's that. Uh, and that's the country. All the red counties are counties shipping more than 25% of their workers out. Obviously, big counties you know, going to distort it. Uh, you can see up around Portland up there what happens. My neck of the woods, Virginia, Maryland, are the center. There's only two counties in the whole state of Virginia that don't ship 25% of their workers out. And we can talk a lot about what's causing that and what's going on. But this is an immensely important force out into the future. This kind of blows it up so you can get a little closer view. <clears throat> in terms of the flows, 64% of the growth was in suburb to suburb flows. 14% uh, was in the traditional suburb to central city. But 19% was center city outbound. So we had greater, much greater growth outbound than inbound. And the central city to central city was only 3% of the growth. And this is, I think, an important aspect of where we are for the future. The, I call it the donut metro. Uh, we got a seven and a half million people commuting out to the suburbs and seven and a half million commuting in from exurbs, from rural populations. The, the two states with the greatest travel time increases were West Virginia and New Hampshire. It wasn't the congestion in Wheeling. Uh, it was people in West Virginia commuting to the Washington metropolitan area, commuting to the Pittsburgh metropolitan area, and to the metro areas in Ohio. And this is, I think, in many respects, the nature of our future. I don't need to show you that. And this is, this is what the flow picture looks like. And this is just to emphasize the fact that one of the keys now is intermetropolitan flows. People in the suburbs of one metro area working in the suburbs of another metro area. Even central city to central city flows. There's an expansion here, whether it's an opening up of job opportunity or whatever it is, people are taking advantage of these very long potential commutes. Uh, I just want to emphasize the fact that, that the two keys in transportation are time and cost, and those are the things that we're worst at measuring, whether it's in the freight side or the passenger side. We are very, very bad at all of this. Our travel time information, our cost information, our purchased information, our transit services information, all keyed to this uh, things that are critical and yet we don't know what we're, how we're doing it and how well we're doing. I mentioned my keys on travel time. Uh, and you can see, again, this pattern of the 20-minute commute 
significant. West. It's basically a Midwestern phenomenon where they're still above 20 minutes, and the Northeast actually bends the whole actually bends the whole country. New York can actually distort the, the entire national picture. Um, I want to close with a reference here to a couple of questions. This is the questions raised in <clears throat> Community in America 2. These are the questions that I raised 10 years ago, and I thought that by now I'd have the answer to them, and I, I have to say that I don't. there's not one of these questions that has been answered. They have answers that will persist out in the future. It's going to be another 10, maybe another 20 years before we know whether job worker balance matters much, whether the minorities will be very different or become typical of typical. Will the technological fixes actually work? Will immigration trends shift towards the mainstream? All of these things are questions that are still open questions for us. And I've added a few more, and these are the ones I would leave you with. Number one, who and where will the workers be? In a society where workers and skilled workers will be at a premium and employers will go wherever those workers want to be, wherever those workers would like to be, a mountaintop in Colorado, downtown Portland, wherever it is, it will be amenities-based in many respects, uh, people going where they'd like to be. When I left New York, I grew up as a transportation planner. My first job was working for Doug Carroll at Tri-State in New York. And I said, I'm an urban planner. Urban planners can plan herbs anywhere. And as long as I can do it anywhere, I might as well do it in a nice place, right? And I think that that's kind of typical of the services industry, which says, as long as I'm doing this, I might as well do it in a nice place. And employers in the future will have to recognize that. They'll have to be more responsible, more flexible, more, in order to gain those skilled workers, they're going to be reacting very strongly to that. Um, and the question here is still, will, will the value of time still be the driver? I think it will. But obviously, the price of gasoline changes that calculus. And finally, my question i like to leave you, will the value of mobility be recognized? I think we're a society that, kind of like with running water, you don't really much care about it until it stops. Um, maybe mobility is one of those things that we tend to take for granted uh, until it stops. So at that, I'll leave you. Uh, usually, I, uh, I say that uh, commuting in America is available in gas stations, 7-Elevens all over America. But these days, it's not. It's only available at the TRB. And you, so you have to go find it there. Uh, and I know maybe somebody's going to assign it to you in a class to look at it. But anyway, thank you very much. And uh, let's uh, talk about it and maybe have some questions. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. When you talked about the percentage of commuters who leave their home county and also go from the central city to central city, does that include who crosses their borders as well, or is that is that separate I don't, state I don't, borders? I don't know. I'm quite sure. Or oh, does that include state borders? Did you say yes? Yeah. If it doesn't matter, if it's if it's uh, the the census actually divides be counties within your state or out of the state, and I put I've added the two together. Yeah, so it's anybody, it's any count, anytime you leave your home county. Sir, hi, Bob. Yes. Uh, I, Metro did a study a couple of years ago that said that uh, the average automobile carries about 1,500 passenger trips per year. That sounds a lot, but mm -hmm. okay. 1,450 or okay. some number like that. Okay. Um, if I was trying to develop a number that says, how much does it cost to take a car off the road? I mean, we have one rail project here that costs $100 subsidy per new transit rider. How much does it take a car off the road? What factors would I have to stick in there? Looking at peak hours, how many trips of a uh, typical automobile are made during peak hours, for example, peak commuting hours? Yeah, that's a, that's a whale of a question. That's a, that's a couple of PhD theses. Uh, there's a wonderful chart that I tried to put in the book, and it just was very hard to do. Uh, the people who do the NHTS, the NPTS, um, produced this chart, and I can send it to you. It's a chart of auto use by trip purpose by half hour increment of the day. 
And what it basically shows is the peak distribution and the, and the trip purpose distribution. The reason that I didn't use it is it gets very messy to calculate the aggregates because of the, the way the NPTS is structured. But the answer is uh, that there isn't a whole lot of this going on in the peak hour. It's still, it is, there is a lot of it and it's big, but compared to the other stuff, it's, it's relatively minor. I, I, I don't want to push that, I, I, there's a tendency for people to interpret what I'm saying is that, is that the peak hour doesn't matter anymore or that commuting doesn't matter. It's still very powerful. Uh, what I, I guess the way I would argue today is the home and the workplace are the two uh, anchors around which so much of our travel occurs. And it's either generated from the workplace or from the home. And so those locations do matter. And the peak hour is still defined in many respects by the commute. I didn't mean peak hour. I meant like 6 to 9 in the morning and yeah, 4 right, to 7 I understand. I understand. in the afternoon. Yeah. And the number I come up with, if, you know, it, you know, if it's, let's say, 1,500 passenger trips per vehicle, yeah. and half of them are, uh, are made during that interval, like, and then average vehicle occupancy rate, yeah. uh, Hundred thousand dollars in some cases to take a single car off the road during these commuting hours. Well, I, the, the 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 factor I would raise, without getting too far into it, is when you look at the data, you tend to see of if you if you scratch the surface, carpool riders look an awful lot like transit users, and there's a tendency to trade back and forth. You improve carpooling, people slide from transit into carpooling. You. you Transit gets better and, and carpoolers leave. And so what has happened is, is that we haven't so much had people shift to, to driving alone. The number of people moving by automobile doesn't change as much as the number of vehicles those people are in. And so there's been a sliding from carpooling into single occupant. Some of the people going, and so a lot of that trade off. So one of the things I use, for instance, is, is the share of carpooling plus transit. And, yeah, as a, as, a, as a measure of merit. And it, if you look at the number 20%, what metro areas have 20% of their people in carpool plus transit? And the answer is three, four, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, Washington, end of story. Um, interesting, Boston, 17, 18%. Houston, 17, 18%. Totally different. Houston, 15%. Carpool, two or three percent transit. Boston, fifteen percent transit, two or three. Yeah. So you get that very strong mix. Uh, Jerry, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would like to get into the um, uh, working at home a little bit more detail. Yeah. Um, it seems to me there's a difference between people who work at home constantly or people who work at home one or two days a week. Yes. There's some evidence that people who work at home one or two days a week might actually commute longer. Uh, because you know they're, they're making the commute uh, less frequently. Uh, do you have any insights on that as to what we're seeing? Is it what the the work at home constantly who might move to the mountaintop, or is it the work at home occasionally? Yeah. Uh, well, the history of that goes back to a book uh, by uh, Spektorsky, written in the 50s, called The Exurbanites. And this, I mean, so we're talking the 50s, right? And this was this first came about. Uh, because of the big show people in New York, the, the Broadway people. And they tended to move to Bucks County, Pennsylvania, which is 50 miles, 60 miles. And those are the people who had to be in Manhattan once in a while. You know, you're writing a great screenplay, you're working on a script. You go to Manhattan to talk to your editor once a week, twice a week. And so those people had kind of shifted. And I think we still see that playing out in the society. So I, I have no doubt that if, in fact, you let people, uh, you know, if they're only going to work twice a week to a workplace, that they will take advantage of it. I mean, that's the nature of transportation. I think. Um, and the question is, is that a bad or a good thing? Um, I fo my focus on working at home is on those people who have no other workplace. That is their workplace, like me. I'm, I work at home. The um, the incidental, the occasional work at home or telecommute 
is a, a much bigger thing and a little bit harder to measure and a little bit harder. Uh, some of the people who love to promote that kind of way overstated the Sunday supplement kind of thing. You know, everybody brings a briefcase home is working at home. Um, I I don't know how that's going to play out in the future. There's no question there can be a lot more of it, and it will it will have an influence. And I'd I'd love to have a better sense of it. I don't know the answer to it. Um, you mentioned. Uh, Ferries and commuter rail, is that by any chance mainly a New York phenomenon? And then uh, my second question is, how much of this nation's prosperity do you figure is due to private ownership of automobiles and the freedom it gives us? The for, actually, the first question is, the, the commuter rail and the ferry is very limited. The ferry stuff is New York, Seattle, San Francisco. San Francisco. And I think that's, there are more, there are many more than you think of when you start going through them, but but in terms of the percentage distribution, it's primitive. Commuter rail is, is broader than that. It's New York, Chicago again, but Washington has a big component of commuter rail and it's growing around the country. Uh, but it tends to be very, it's always the longest trip length in terms of, of travel time and tends to be the highest income. As far as the second question and the, the influence uh, of the oil ownership, I would say that without getting into the, the economic, uh, the scale of, of auto ownership, I would say that the, the mobility that, that the automobile provides to the society is immensely powerful in terms of total productivity. One of the things that the French have done lately is looked at access to job opportunity. And for every 10% increase you get in the number of jobs th that you can reach or the number of employees you can reach of your employer, you get a tremendous new boost in productivity. And I think this is going to be a factor that's going to play out in our future. Uh, it'll be immensely important to have these large metro areas with the ability to access 100,000 potential employees for high-skilled operations. You're going to need that immense labor force market shed to feed these capabilities. Yes, sir? Can we reduce computing in terms of freights? In terms of? Freight. Oh, freight? Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking of writing freight in America. No. Uh, <clears throat> freight I, I am very pleased to have seen in the last less than 10 years an increasing emphasis and recognition of the importance of freight. Um, it has an immense leavening power. It forces reality home on us, uh, which I think is just an immensely important aspect. Going back to the previous question about economic productivity, uh, in Baltimore, let me just contrast Baltimore and Washington. Our total output in Washington is paper and garbage. <laughs> Sometimes interchangeable. Uh, there's almost nothing in the way of productive output, manufacturing output. There's distribution of foodstuffs and stuff like that in Washington. And so we sort of can neglect thinking about freight with some degree of impunity. We impose costs on the freight delivery system, the FedEx guy, the UPS guy, the, the guy who's bringing the food stuff to the store, et cetera. And that, but those costs are hidden. Up the road is Baltimore, and they have a port. And they get into an argument about transit versus highways, and they think that that's all there is to transportation. And then some guy says, I got a ship coming in tomorrow with 3,000 containers. What would you like me to do with it? And I think that really forces people to focus their minds. Those are 3,000 real containers that are going to have to go somewhere. They're going to have to go through the city streets. Is that the way you want to do it? You can put them in a tunnel and go under the streets. You, I mean, but you do have to address the fact that, like Long Beach, you know, holy smoke, those ships keep coming in. They keep bringing, and they're getting bigger. 
and so I think it is instructive for transportation that freight forces us to kind of recognize the economic scale and the stuff that matters. And of course, the people in Texas have learned that from NAFTA, big time. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering if you could talk about the role of gender in mode choice, whether and how this has changed over the last couple of decades. A yeah, great question, fun question. Um, I don't think I put it in this volume. Last volume, uh, I did a chart with a ratio of male to female by, by mode. And the answer is that it was very close in the big modes. Driving alone was very close. Uh, carpooling, women a little more oriented to carpooling. The big differences were in the, forgive me, minor modes. Uh, you won't be shocked to know that motorcycle is more male than female. Uh, bicycling is probably three to one male over female, except in Portland. <laughs> yeah. Uh, taxi cab, much more female. Those, what I've seen over the years is go back to the 50s. Men's jobs and women's jobs very different. Women tended to have the smaller job. The man's job in the household was the dominant job, if you will. That's what defined a lot of the, the activity in the workplace. Uh, the woman's job tended to be part-time, tended to be closer to home, shorter trip length, uh, more oriented to transit. As women's jobs have become more like men's jobs, the mode behavior has become more like, like men. So in that sense, they're much more, much more similar. Um, <clears throat> the big change that I saw, we saw for the first time in, in uh, the 90 data, because it was the first time the census asked the question, was that there was a real shift between men and women in terms of time that they leave home. And I think you saw that in that chart. And, and the time distribution uh, looks, well, let me see if I, if there's a, see if I can draw it for you. Um, the time signature for men kind of looks like this in the work trip and the time signature for women looks kind of like that. It's just kind of like offset by 45 minutes an hour. And what has happened in the last 10 years is both of them have tended to move in this direction. They both have tended to move earlier and they both have tended to squeeze the peak down. And so the peak spread is going in both directions for men and women. But it looks to me like the relationship between them hasn't changed much. And I, I haven't done the arithmetic to say that, you know, that it's exactly the same in any kind of a percentage sense. But it, it looks like it's been just a spatial shift of both of them. So women's work is getting earlier, like men's. Uh, but still, as I pointed out there, the early morning stuff, the 5, 6 a.m. thing, is very male-oriented. And that's occupationally based. It's socially based. It's women's responsibilities in the home, getting kids off to school. It's uh, service occupations versus manufacturing. There's a lot of factors. But it's, it's a fun subject. Somebody should do a pursuit. Did you? I was going to comment that maybe the differences in times leaving home is like a perceived safety issue. I know that women don't travel. I don't have any problem with in that. In dark. fact, that, that's just been pointed out to me uh, by and several women. And the mode women, split I, as well. Probably. Sorry? And the mode split, like women are less likely to take public transportation because of the safety issue. I, 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 again, I don't have any data on that, but yes, I, I, I perfectly, I certainly would, would accept that. Yes, sir. The, the concept of a, a jobs housing balance yes. is something that we talk about a lot in regional oh. planning. Yeah. And as we see this suburban to suburban commuting taking more and more of the, the share in commuting, I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, is there any reason to believe that jobs housing balance is going to make a difference? Well, I got beat up in both directions uh, in this book. I, I do a section on, on jobs housing balance. And the people who think it's the most important thing in the world say, I, I didn't do it enough. And the people who think it's really dumb said, why were you spending all your time on that? Uh, 
And the answer is that uh, is some of you who have read Commuting in America 2 will know I, um, I made up a mythical community called Fairfax County, Virginia, and, <laughs> and talked about it and, and, and addressed the, the, the job worker balance in Fairfax County. And let me see if I can reconstruct. 1980, it was probably, oh, six jobs for every worker. I'm sorry, six, point six jobs for every worker. In 90, it was 0.8. And now, in 2000, we have perfection. It's one. And it's been disastrous. Um, the other thing that you have to look at is what percent of the people in the county fill those jobs. And so what I talk about is kind of a repository sense of this is the kind of the perfect relationship. What is the real relationship? Right next to it is the Planners Delight Arlington County, which everybody loves. And they say, gee, we ought to have a jobs housing balance like Arlington. It happens to be 1.3 jobs per worker. So everybody in America should have 1.3 jobs per worker which doesn't seem to, so we have a lot of Canadians coming every day. Anyway, the point is that in Arlington, their tendency to live and work in the same county is much less than, than Fairfax. They have a much poorer skills relationship between their workers and their jobs. And so that means they have to export a lot more people every day and import a lot more people every day. Uh, and so it really throws into question, especially what happened in, in Fairfax County. To get to this balance, we created more jobs than we added workers, which as a result of a not so big shift in live and work in the same county shares, we ended up with a colossal requirement to import people every day. And so there's been a dramatic shift in the county of imports and in Washington now you have this kind of weird thing. People, in, if those of you who know the county, uh, the kind of looks like this. This is PG County, this is Montgomery County, and this is Virginia. And the people in PG go to Montgomery, the people in Montgomery go to Virginia. I mean, you have this around the beltway this way and then back around the other way. And so Virginia is importing colossal numbers of people every day to fill the back the fact that they don't quite have all those people live and work in the same place. And I, the, I would argue, by the way, and this is a place where you can get into all kinds of fistfights, that if, in fact, everybody did live and work in the same place, in the same county, let's say we use that as the spatial measure, what have you got? If you've got 20 counties that comprise the metropolitan area, and everybody lives and works in their own county. You've got 25 little hamlets that happen to be adjacent. The thing that matters is that when I'm here, I have access in a 50-mile radius to 100,000, 200,000 workers. That's the powerful thing. The fact that everybody lives outside the factory gate, that happened 100 years ago, and it's not very important. Uh, so there are too many factors. I was saying coming over here that I worked in China where they owned the factories, they owned the housing, and they owned the workers, and they assigned everybody, and they still couldn't get it right. So I'm not very enthusiastic. I, I don't disagree with having a job worker balance higher, closer to one, looks better than not. And the whole country is moving in that direction. Center cities are declining. Suburbs are, are increasing. But... There's a lot more to it than just that number. I guess that's the big answer to our long. Sorry, sir. Is there enough experience with London's congestion pricing of schemes to, to have any lessons for us in the United States? Very good. Thank you. Um, no. <laughs> uh, the, the, the fact that people are surprised that you can price people out of the system is a surprise to me. I mean, why, why are we surprised? Um, yes, it works. Yes, it can work. The question is, what are the ultimate ramifications? Um, and the ultimate ramifications is not the improvement in the street system. That's, that's an artifact. Um, but that, to me, is almost trivial. Um, 
the question will be ultimately, what are the retail sales look like? Uh, what are the what's the employment look like? What does the value of land look like? What does the value of property look like? When you start to see people leaving, see uh, uh, retail establishments moving out uh, and sales dropping, um, then I think that puts an entirely different flavor on the picture. I try to, Tim Lomax, I guess a lot of you know Tim does the, the TTI thing and, and the, the, Tim and I work together a lot and the focus that we tend to bring is that Tim focuses on how good is the system doing and I tend to look at how good are people doing. And I think the London thing is like that. You can make the system work. I can make the system work. But the question is, how are the people doing? Is another. It's a very different question. You know, well, the the people aren't so good off, but the, my system's doing great. You know, that that kind of question. So, London. It may very well be that it's going to work out swell because there are immensely high income people in the city. You know, the city as they call it, the the center, which is basically Wall Street and with very narrow streets and very little access. And those people may be willing to pay an incredible amount of money to get into the center well, easily. Uh, and it may be acceptable for them and it may be acceptable for everybody in some larger sense to have everything else get out of the way, have those Bond Street retail shops go somewhere else. That, you know, that may be the right arithmetic. Um, so I won't argue with it, but I, I still say that the that school's still out. It'll take a while. Uh, sir, to when we go to lady, uh, gentleman behind you. Sorry, yeah, you. Yeah, well, I was taught in that at least for Germany that over the last decades and probably even longer, the number of trips per day was fairly constant, and as well that the overall trip time, uh, travel time spent in transportation per day was constant, not just commuting, but over, overall. Is that true in the U.S.? No. The, we used to have this wonderful Zahavian statement that said, uh, you know, Zakov Zahavi, who talked about the fact that basically an hour, an hour and ten minutes a day had been true since Roman times, of the, number, the amount of time people spent traveling. But the NPTS stuff seems to show increasing total time and travel per day, a share that the share of total day that people put into transportation is increasing. And that you can get into arguments about whether that's true or not. But it, it seems to me like it is happening, that it is that we are devoting a bigger share of our time. One of the reasons for it in some of the arguments about my focus on the value of time is that in both the automobile and in some of the transit modes, we're making that time less painful. Um, listen to books, uh, critical factor, the cell phone, the fact, particularly for women, uh, working women, that the cell phone keeps you connected to the world, you're stuck in traffic. You can call home and say, turn off the TV and do your homework, or I'll be there in 10 minutes, or if somebody can yell and call you. I think that a lot of those things have improved, reduced the pain associated uh, with, uh, with, with the, the more onerous commutes. There are other things. There's a book uh, out of MIT called Bowling Alone. You may have seen it. It says that, this is one of the explanations for a decline in participation in the community. Fewer people going to a PTA meeting and stuff like that. So there are those other ramifications, but it's a tough question to address. I think we probably need to stop. Rob, where are you? Do we need uh, can we t one more question? Anyone? Okay, one more question? Anyone? Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I guess somebody who didn't ask a question. No. You're, you're no. Um, getting back to um, uh, two questions ago where you were talking about sort of the big picture. Um, I, a little over 10 years ago, I, I worked in a, a county in the Northeast in, in New Jersey that was a high growth county. And our planning director would make statements like, well, you know, Detroit wishes they add our congestion. You know, at that time, Detroit was severely on the decline. Right. And, you know, they're 
people cynically <laughs> talking about turning into an urban museum. Um, do you have any thoughts as to what level of congestion is healthy, and how would you come up, come up with sort of a normative evaluation based on what you've seen? That's a great, great question, and, and, I, and I don't have uh, anything like an answer. I've been asked that question a lot, uh, unfortunately, by people who, governors who have the power to beat me about the head when I can't answer them. Um, the, Tim Lomax and I have worked in a number of, of states, and, um, and a lot of them now are increasingly upset about congestion and, and very sensitive to the economic losses. In Austin, uh, Dell Computer told the governor and the mayor that they were moving their next facility out and going somewhere else because of congestion, and boy, did that focus people's attention on the subject. And got a lot of attention. Uh, Tim and I used uh, a number of, you know, the TTI index that he uses, which is basically the ratio of, uh, of peak to off-peak travel time. And we started out with a number of 1.15, an effective 15% penalty for the peak hour. And we went out to the MPOs and tested that and had them tested in their network models. and. And they came back with a number that was more like 1.18 to 1.20, which was getting rid of everything worse than level of service D, roughly. Uh, Tim and I went to Georgia, same thing. The governor, very upset about congestion. Atlanta, of course, one of the worst in the country in terms of growth and congestion. And we proposed something like this, um, and what the MPO uh, ARC came out with was more of a number like 1.35, mostly because they thought that that's what they could achieve. Uh, we kept arguing that economically it was more sensible to be back here. And Texas was saying, the governor in Texas was saying, tell me what it takes to make Texas a world-class competitive city that I can compete with other cities in the United States, world-class state, with cities that can compete with other cities and with the world, that, I'm, that we're going to be as good as I And that was the number we came at. In Georgia, the focus was much more, boy, this is tough. This is hard. It's expensive. And it is. Of course it is. Um, but these numbers are relative to where they're going. They're both All of these areas are up in the 145 to 155, and they're all going to 1.75, you know. And so to get to get it back, a range back to 135 is prodigious. I agree. Um, one should be able to calculate the accessibility impacts and the cost impacts. Um, we're not very good at that. The national models that we work with for reauthorization uh, tend to show that there are colossal benefits to reducing congestion and delay thousands of hours of delay uh, per million dollars would be the that that's the metric that I would use is thousands of hours of delay reduced per per million dollars per hundred million whatever you want to talk. Uh, would, that's one of the ways that I would get at that. We propose that. I haven't seen anybody do that arithmetic yet. Um, yeah, that would be great to see. I'm sure there's a PhD in there somewhere. Yeah, I guess we'd better quit. That note, yes, before we thank Alan for uh, spending time with us today, I'll remind you that Ann Goodchild will be here next week talking about freight. She's from the University of Washington, so hope to see you then. Thanks for joining us. Alan, thank you very much. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. It was fun. You said something about mailing the article on auto use by trip purpose. I did. Half hour increments. Oh yes, yes. I'll uh, I'll send that to you. Okay. Is that your card? That's my oh, card. No, you, you don't need that. Yes. This is what I'm doing. Oh okay. If you have a chance, take a look. I, one of the things I did want to talk about is that the bigger carpools look an awful lot like 